knife, chip, and shatter. Dune has been taking over everything by storm, by sandstorm this recently, which by the way, I also wanna say that like, I was a part of the first Dune like I was a Dune lover since Dune part one where everyone was saying it was slow, it was set up. It was obviously a part one. I was over there writing for it saying that I, I love Dune was my letterbox review talking about how the lady next to me fell asleep after playing Candy Crush for the first hour. Yes, but I've been loving Dune since it came out. I loved Dune. Like I was literally like, you guys aren't ready for Dune part two. Have I read the books? No. Have I watched the original movie? No. But you guys have been wanting me to talk about Dune for a very long time. I got a lot of requests to do a video on Dune part one and again for Dune part two. Today we're gonna be talking about why Dune succeeds and why it succeeds in, in comparison to its other counterpart franchises that really do try to emulate the success of a successful franchise of the likes of something like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings from back in the day when franchises were really in its, you know, prime years. I don't think we've had a very booming franchise in a while. I think even the ones that are rebooting and remaking have been failing. And Dune has been one of the ones that the success is something that you can't deny. And there's integral parts to that. And I wanna talk about those integral parts today. Firstly, let's get into what is Dune. What is Dune? What the hell is this? What is Dune? What, who's in Dune? Who makes Dune? The first film from the 80s, which is directed by David Lynch, it's based off a book from a guy named Frank Herbert, Hubert. Herbert. The recent adaptation stars some of your favorite actors that you have been dying to see in a movie together. Spaces like Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya. You have stars like Rebecca Ferguson and Oscar Isaac. And with part two, you have a cast coming on that is so good, you can't deny it. It's got Christopher Walken, Austin Butler, Florence Pugh. You even have faces in the Dune universe of superheroes that you might know, like Jason Momoa, Josh Brolin, uh, David Batista, And you have your seasoned actors that you love seeing in every single job that they do, it's like Stellan Skarsgård and Javier Bardem. And all directed by Denis Villeneuve. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. I'm not a French speaker. My name is Denis Villeneuve. And I've been saying Villeneuve for a very long time. So my, my mouth doesn't operate to say Villeneuve anymore. It, it really wants to say Villeneuve. My name is Denis Villeneuve. You have a lot of cool characters within Dune. You have Timothy Chalamet, who is Paul Atreides. He's like this super cool, brown haired, curly haired, brown eyed, like amazing guy who is like really attractive and really, you know, cool. Like he can fight and he's like, you know, noble and stuff at first. Um, you have Zendaya who plays Chani, who is a part of the Fremen people. And she's a Fadaikin, which is like a fighter for the Fremen people, like kind of like they're like, uh, they're soldiers. You have Lady Jessica, who's a, a space witch. She's a Bene Gesserit, which is a space witch. You have Leto Atreides, which is uh, Paul Dad. He died. You have the Baron, which is the leader of the House of Harkonnens, and he's really ugly, and he's bald, and he's ill and he's he sits in black goop and is always vaping and he has two nephews he has glossu rabin which is played by dave bastista and then fade which is played by austin butler with his shaved head no eyebrows uh blackout teeth and you know and austin and and austin and austin and Austin. And Austin. And Austin. Mid video question, you need to leave a comment down below right now if you think Fade is sexy. Do you want to smack the bald head? There's a lot of different people in this movie and I feel like you guys should definitely watch it if you wanna like understand what's going on. Um, but that's like, in short, that's kind of like the gist of it. But like, well, like, here's a full summary if you really wanna know what's going on. Okay, I'm going to be explaining Dune to you with my whiteboard and with simple terms. Dune follows character Paul. This is Paul. Paul has two parents, Lady Jessica and Duke Leto. Those are his parents. So the people that made him, all these three people belong to the house of Atreides. They belong to the house of Atreides, but something tragic happens to the house of Atreides. The house of Atreides gets taken out. 
taken out. By who you may ask? A different house. What's that other house? This house is the house of Harkonnens. The house of the Harkonnens, they go pew, 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 at the house of Atreides. But there's another house that's involved, which is the house of Corino, the house of Corino. That actually told the house of Harkonnens to pew, pew, pew at the house of Atreides. So really, the house of Harkonnens, they did do that. They did complete the mission of taking out the house of Atreides, but the house of Corino, was the one who sent the message. Now, who belongs to these other houses? The house of Harkonnens, so think of H. The H house holds the bald people. Who are the bald people? You have the Baron and Fade, AKA Fade Rothen, AKA Austin Butler. So Austin and Stellan Skarsgård are in the house of H. And Austin. In the house of Carino, you have the Emperor. How do you spell Emperor? I don't know. Emperor, which is Christopher. Christopher Walken and the Empress. And the Empress, which is Florence Pugh. Stellan. Austin, Florence. So Christopher Walken tells House of Harkonnens, Stellan Skarsgård to take out House of Atreides. That is what happens in the first Dune movie. What happens to Paul, Duke, and Lita if their house was taken out? Their their whole their whole species, all their people. Well, Lady Jessica and Paul make it out alive. But you know who doesn't? Duke Leto. He dies. The Emperor kills him. The Emperor's like, no, 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 no. Paul and Lady Jessica escape to another planet called Arrakis. Okay, so let's talk about a, a planet called Arrakis. Arrakis. This is Arrakis. Arrakis is home to the Fremen. Fremen are desert people. They live amongst the sand and they have suits that they like poop and pee in and it's really cool. But Arrakis is also home to something called spice, which is a drug. Spice, spice. So what is spice? Spice is a hallucinogenic drug that the Fremen people be taken and it's what makes their eyes blue. Who wants the spice on this planet? Well, none other than the Harkonnens of the Emperor because the spice is basically like oil. The spice is basically like oil to them. If you have control over the spice, you have control over the uh, the world, the, the universe, basically. So they want spice. The Fremen people are like, no, what the heck? You can't take over our planet. They want to keep their planet of Arrakis. Arrakis. And Paul and Lady Jessica have fled to them. So Paul and Lady Jessica now want to become Fremen. Now we're leaning into Dune 2 territory. Everything else was Dune 1. Now we're in Dune 2. They're like, I want to become Fremen. I want to be like them. I want to be like them. What, what, what? And there's a few characters from the Fremen that we need to Remember, Silgar, Demis, and Chani. Now Chani is the important one. Well, they're all important, but Chani is a very important one because not only is she a Fremen, she's a Fikin, she's a Fadaikin. She's a Fadaikin, which is a fighter to the Fremen people. I'm not gonna spell Fadaikin because I don't know how to spell it. And Austin. And Paul wants to become a Fadaikin. To prove that he can be a Fremen, he challenges someone. Who does he challenge? Jemis. And he kills Jemis. And they're like, ooh, he means business. So he's hanging out with them. One thing that we have not gotten to, which is very important, is the Bene. Deserts. The Bene Gesserits. What are the Bene Gesserits? They are space witches. Or space witches. They're space witches. What do they do? They control politics. So they are really, the space witches are in control of politics and power. How do they do that? With religion. The Bene Gesserits like to control people with, uh, you know, their powers because they can like, you know, do things like they pick the gender of their baby and use the voice on people to make them do things so they can basically make anyone do anything that they want. Who's a Bene Gesserit? Lady Jessica. Lady Jessica is a Bene Gesserit. The Bene Gesserits have reverend mothers. Who needs a reverend mother right now? The Fremen. The Fremen are like, we need a new reverend mother our design. Lady Jessica, we know you're a Bene Gesserit. You become our new reverend mother. Okay. So she's like, let me do this. But they're like, you have to drink the water of life. Talking about the water of life and spice. These are both things that come from the sandworm. The sand worm. The sand worm has the water of life, which is what? Worm pee. And spice, which is worm poop. So all of these things that they'd be using come from the sand worm, which is a big, big, uh, like Alaskan bull worm. It, 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 they pound the ground and it comes and they can ride them and they eat their poop and they drink their pee. It's a very worshiped creature. Lady Jessica drinks the water of life, which is the sand worm pee. She drinks it and she's like, hey, like, I think I got a plan. Oh, I also forgot to mention, Lady Jessica is pregnant. Lady Jessica is pregnant. Mid video question, do you think that the embryo baby scenes were necessary? Let me know what, know what you thought about the baby scenes because I had many thoughts on them and I thought it was crazy whenever I watched the movie. Let me know what you thought of the embryo scenes because I, that freaking baby was creeping me out. Creeping me out. Lady Jessica's pregnant this whole time and she drinks the water of life and then her baby's like, we need to control everything. And Lady Jessica drinks the water of life and she's like, I think we can control this whole damn show right now. Like, I think we can do it. Start with the weaker Fremen and then move on to the South, the more religious side, and we can control this whole planet. I don't have any room on my freaking board right now. I have to erase some stuff. Sorry, dude, you're not important anymore. 
So Lady Jessica, not only is she pregnant, we already know that, she starts using the prophecy. The prophecy. The prophecy is something that a lot of Fremen, right, the Fremen down here, believe in, mostly within the South, because they are religious. And so Lady Jessica knows this. She knows this because all Bene Gesserits know this, because all Bene Gesserits do is make sure that they have these prophecies within place so that they can have any sort of control over any planet with any sort of sign of life. Because if people can believe in one thing, they can make sure it happens and they can have prophecies fulfilled to make sure that they have control. Because the way you can control people is through religion. She starts spreading prophecies. What are the prophecies? That her son, Paul, is the Messiah. That he is going to save the Fremen. That he is going to save the Fremen people. That he is going to save them from who's coming to take their spice, the Harkonnens and the Corinos. They are gonna come to take their spice and land and wipe them out. And they're having these, they've been battling the Harkonnens. The Harkonnens have been trying to kill all signs of life on the planet of Arrakis, because they want to take over the planet of Arrakis. But little did they know that there's a reverend mother named Lady Jessica, who is spreading a prophecy about her son, Paul, being the Messiah. Messiah goes by Muad'Dib. Muad'Dib wins Desert Mouse. They keep calling him Lisan al -Gid. Lisan al -Gid is the Messiah. So every single time he does something that is in line with the prophecy, he gets called Nisan al -Gid. Paul is the foreseen prophecy fulfiller. And who's not a believer in the prophecy? His very Chani. Chani is a non-believer. Non-believer. And Paul's GF. Didn't see that coming, did you? So she sees Lady Jessica and her, her the leader of the Fremen, Fadaikin, Stilgar, being like, I think Paul is the Messiah, the Nisan al -Gid. And Chani's like, no, you're not. That's religious prophecy. You're using this to control people. This is not real. And Paul's like, okay. But then like Paul's like, wait a second, like, I want to get revenge for my father. I want to kill the Harkonnens and the Emperor who took out my father, right? And took out all the people I knew. He took out House of Atreides. So then he starts seeing this and he's like, I think I want to take revenge. And how can I take revenge on these people? Well, by fulfilling the prophecy. By fulfilling the prophecy that his mother is going into place. So Paul goes to the south. We, saw, we said that earlier. With the religious people. And he drinks what his mom drank earlier, which is worm pee. He starts drinking the worm pee and sees that he is the Messiah. So Paul's like, I'm the freaking messiah, yes! And he's like, let's take out these motherfuckers. But what he didn't know that was going on on the sidelines was that a few of the Bene Gesserits that are with the House of Corino, and you know what the Bene Gesserit does? The Reverend Mother that is at the House of Corino? Remember the Empress, she's talking to the Empress. The Reverend Mother, Bene Gesserit, talking to the Empress, the Emperor's daughter. And she's like, your daddy ain't gonna get out of this without any sort of uh, consequence. He already did his crime, he took out a house leader, a house, without warning, without de declaration of war. So they had no defense up against them. That is bad, that is very bad. And the Reverend Mother is like, the only way that we are going to be able to save our ass is find someone else to fulfill the prophecy made by the Bene Gesserit. And you can't control Paul, no, 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 because you killed his daddy, someone you can't control, Coming back over here with Fade, Austin, and Austin, and Austin. Austin is the Baron's nephew. The Baron's nephew. The Baron is the one that leads the Harkonnens and he looks very disgusting. He also looks like that because he was given an STI by the person who gave birth to Lady Jessica. Plot twist, Lady Jessica is the Baron, the leader of the Harkonnens who killed her husband. That is her daddy. Oh my goodness, that is her freaking daddy. And so that means Fade and Paul are cousins. And so they're having a cousin off. They're having a cousin off and being like, which one of us can fulfill the prophecy, but neither of them know that the other exists right now. But the Bene Gesserit, the Reverend Mother of House of Corno, is like, let's take the House of Harkonnens, little, little boy, the youngest of the Harkonnens, and control him and make him win the challenge against Paul and take over Arrakis. That way we, we can still have control over Arrakis. The Empress will take the role of the Emperor and Faith will take over Arrakis and we will still have control over Arrakis and still have power. But she doesn't know that Lady Jessica and Paul are off their rockers on worm pee. They're off their rockers on it. They're on a whole other level, controlling people left and right. And so what happens is House of Harkonnen, House of Corno goes to Arrakis. They're like, what the fuck is going on here? Because the House of Harkonnens keep sending people and they keep dying because the Fremen are very good at killing. What happens is the Fremen and Paul decide to attack the House of Harkonnens and the House of Corno. Why? Because what we did just, what we left out was that Paul now has access to the House of Atreides arsenal that he didn't know he had, but his good old friend that he didn't know survived journey told him, I know where your dad hid the arsenal so we can have it and declare war on whoever the F we want because we got that arsenal, we have bombs. We have bombs so we can do whatever we want basically is what he said. And Paul is like, that's kind of slay. I think that's what daddy would want he, me to do. I think he would want me to take revenge for him and wipe out other houses because of what they did to us. Fremen pull up on their sandworms. Ha! Okay, Paul pulls up. Paul and the Fremen pull up, and you know what they do? They kill a bunch of Harkonnens. Boom, boom, boom. Basically take them out, basically. Takes out the Baron, kills the Baron, because he's the one that actually did do the killing of his daddy. And 
take out House of Coronel. And then Paul is like, well, you're cornered. What are you going to do now? Emperor, you have to challenge me. Give me your daughter. He's like, give me your daughter, Florence. Give me your daughter, Florence. And I will take everything that you have. And then Fade is like, if you're going to do this, you got to challenge me because you have to challenge someone to be able to take their stuff, right? And so Fade is like, come on. Lay that knife, chip, and shower. And they, they duel. Cousin duel. Cousin duel between the two chosen ones, basically. Cousin duel and... No shocker here, Fade dies like a boss with his bald head and weird personality. And Austin. And Paul wins. Paul's a winner. Yay. Paul's a winner. And he makes the emperor like kiss his ring, his daddy's ring. He's like, kiss it. Mm. Kiss it. And then Chani, the non-believer and Paul's girlfriend, sees not only is Paul power hungry and taking out people, he's also like, give me your hand, empress. And she's like, oh, what the freak? And two seconds earlier, he was like, I will love you as long as I breathe. And then he was like, empress, like be my wife. Anyways, what we have not mentioned is that there are other houses at play. These are not the only three houses that we see. There are other houses. There are other houses. Do I know them? No, I don't know their names. But the other houses are like, we refuse. I refuse. I refuse to accept this new title of Paul Atreides. This is not okay. We will not have our emperor taken away. I refuse. I refuse. And Paul is like, that's fine. You can refuse my title all you want. But what did you forget? My, my arsenal. My arsenal. My arsenal, you forgot my arsenal. He goes, team, if any of these motherfuckers don't want to accept my new title, I'm gonna blow them up. So this, what he does, Paul declares, he declares the holy war. He's like, if anybody wants to come at me, if anybody wants to say any shit about my friends, I'll declare the holy war. And then Chani, Chani is heartbroken. Chani is heartbroken and also, sad and she rides off on a sandworm in sadness and that is the plot of dune explained by me trin lovell what does this mean it means paul is power hungry and doesn't really know what it means to be a good person <laughs> he doesn't know what it means to be a good person and he was like actually i think i am the chosen one and i think i will declare a holy war onto all the other houses and basically loses all sense of identity once he drinks the worm pee um and uses his daddy's arsenal to um take out other houses uh which is something that i don't think he would ever have done within the first movie because in the first movie he's very compassionate and very empathetic towards a lot of other people and i don't think his father would have ever wanted him to do that he is now burning bodies in places where he would probably mourn them and with that being said he also takes the fremen with him and leads them to become a very destructive people when in the past they were very much a defensive people who defended themselves in times of need and mourned very gracefully of people but now they are burning bodies by the end of dune part two this is dune this is dune 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 this is dune the holy war what will happen in the next dune i don't know if you have any other thoughts anything that i missed please let me know um this is what i got from it so i hope you liked it So Dune is built very different from other movies as of recent years and other franchises as of recent years. We've seen a lot of franchises flop within the recent years because of just a lot of different things, but I'm going to be pointing out the main reasons why I believe most franchises flop and why I believe that Dune succeeds so well. Aside from the fact that like, it is such a well-crafted movie and a well-crafted piece of art, there are many other elements that lead to its success in my opinion. I think one of the main points that immediately I think everyone can agree on when you're watching anything that is marketed from Dune, whenever you see a poster uh, in a mall or a subway promotion or a billboard or a commercial or, you know, an ad on YouTube, a side banner ad, Anytime you see Dune, you're met with a consistency within its maturity in class. And that sounds so pretentious. That is the one most pretentious things like that came out of my mouth. I get it, but it's true. And one thing that they always, always stick to is how their movie is perceived. And you have a lot of these already preconceived opinions about a sci-fi movie franchise, being as there's so many out there already. Dune makes sure that even in promotion, it's seen as a serious movie. Cause Dune is very serious. Dune has a lot of serious storylines that are very prevalent within today's society. And instead of running away from that seriousness and trying to put a front facing image of something light and something inviting, like, uh, Marvel movies, it chooses to make sure you're aware of the seriousness every single time you see it. 
Is it a fun action movie? Yes, it is. But you're always going to associate Dune with a more serious undertone to it. Whereas something like Marvel puts a front facing image of something that's more lighthearted to get you to go and go to a fun action movie. But I would say that a lot of the topics within Marvel movies, especially something like Infinity War, has a very serious undertone as well and serious topics and risks at stake. Infinity War is about a alien coming down to wipe out half the population on Earth because he's trying to conserve the planet. That's a pretty serious risk at stake, but in the promotions for it, you see it as this big crossover of superheroes coming together in a big action movie. Whereas Dune takes an opposite approach where it's very serious throughout every sing single promotion and every single time you see that ad when you're walking down the street. And I think this is a very integral part of its success because not only is it something where you're promising an audience something and you're delivering on that, you're also, giving the audience something a little bit different from the franchise universe that we haven't seen. Most franchises stick to a little bit more of a lighthearted tone because what you're wanting to do is seek a younger audience that will last longer with your franchise as the franchise continues out longer as it goes on. Whereas Dune knows that it has a wide age range. You're targeting not only an audience of younger people, you're also targeting an audience that is older, that is grew up with the Dune books. The second thing I wanna talk about, and the most important part in my opinion from uh, the immediate success of Dune is the casting. The casting matters and here's why. In recent years, we've seen how much casting can make or break your movie and franchise even within the most recent year of the Oscars happening very soon with a new category added, which is for best casting. From the top to the bottom of this cast, you are greeted with many familiar faces that are very talented faces at that. The cast choices are calculated not only in its choice for casting younger faces to connect to a newer and younger audience, but also choosing older seasoned actors to secure its older audience that definitely grew up knowing and reading the book's Dune. You have to make sure you remember that Dune is made for a very wide age range. Being as there's a lot of people that grew up with Dune, you have to make sure that you are making sure you're uh, marketing towards that age range as well. And what Dune does really well is instead of targeting that younger audience that is obsessed with sci-fi and, and you know aliens and out of this world stuff that you know someone like Star Wars or even the MCU targets a lot of the times, what they do is, is that they really hone in on their teenage audience, which I find to be very interesting. And it's something not only Dune taps into, but a lot of movies nowadays try to hone in that teenage 14 to 21 year old age range because they are some of the most dedicated fans that are gonna continue to not only buy things and support with money, they're also going to be talking about it constantly, updating everyone about it, and Dune does a very good job at honing in on that audience. Right now, we're currently in the rise of Hollywood stars, being a very hot topic that you see talked about within media a lot. You see people talking about the need for a Hollywood star, who's gonna be the next Hollywood star, who's on the rise to becoming the next Hollywood star. And this very much comes from that uh, oversaturation of talent being perceived as only nepotism babies, which is very prevalent and very true. And you also see a lot of people doing things for money and you look at their filmography and it's a very, very uh, calculated cash grab with each one. And not a lot of the times does that succeed. With names like Christopher Walken and Stellan Skarsgård within the cast of Dune, you also are accompanied by younger generations of Hollywood stars like Austin Butler, Timothy Chalamet, and Zendaya, even stars like Florence Pugh and Anya Taylor-Joy in the cast of Dune Part Two. You are accompanied by the it girls, it boys of 2024 that you see within every single fan casting on Twitter. Every single fan casting you see probably has a Florence Pugh in there, probably has an Anya Taylor-Joy in there, probably has a Zendaya in there. They are the stars that people will go to a movie to see. People are gonna go to the theater to see these faces on screen. And the point that I wanna make about casting is that it's not only well-known faces. There are a lot of well-known actors amongst Hollywood, but the choices in you know this group of people for Dune is really important because of their overall image as a person that they have presented to the media. They've done like very, very well like PR runs. Uh, I've seen Timothy Chalamet sweep stuff under the rug like no other celebrity. Like he has done his run. He goes through runs all the time. He, I, 
I remember the hot tub pictures. I've never seen a PR scandal like that swept under so nicely. I only remember what with my brain. And this group of actors have also proven themselves already. And that's not saying that you need actors with a great filmography to cast in your franchise. I just think it's like, I think it's a good idea rather than casting someone who is not as known to be a good actor. I think if you want to do that as a director and a casting agent, I think that is great. I think that's wonderful to give people second chances. But I think for Dune, I think they really were calculated in their choices for every single role and every single potential role that these characters have to play out. It's not rocket science. Uh, I'm not telling you anything that n is new here, but like, I think it's important to differentiate that. You can't just be casting anyone you want. Like the casting freaking matters. And not only that, I think the actors run during their PR is very important. Zendaya is one of the most likable celebrities ever. Like you never, like you should, not only do you never, you should never see anyone spreading hate about Zendaya. She's a very good and likable and reputation amongst everything. You never hear anyone that's met Zendaya that has a bad story. You'll never see her, anyone talking about her on a project where she was acting out. She has a very good and steady career of what she's choosing to go to and what projects she's putting her time towards. It's a very, very calculated machine that runs and it's working. And not only that, she's in every single interview, she's very charming, she's very funny, and she's very intelligent with her responses. And you'll see that all these celebrities have a very similar approach to their interview personalities. Very intelligent, very thoughtful, and very, and all coded in this very charming demeanor. You'll see this with like Florence Pugh. She's one of the most well-known, great, best interviewees ever. She's always going to have a funny interview. Even Rebecca Ferguson has been jumping out of uh, interviews with really clippable moments. Very, very funny, very, very relaxed. And even someone like Austin Butler, who I love making fun of. I love making fun of Austin Butler. He is literally so funny. It is also a part of his draw. And Austin. His whole Elvis career, I was literally just like dying at it. Did I hate that movie? Yes. Is he one of the best interviewees? Yes. He gives such thoughtful responses and, and his demeanor in interviews is so charming. It's so inviting. He seems very interested in the people that he's talking to. And Austin. And I don't know about you, but a lot of the times when I see people in intimidating roles, I assume that they're gonna be like that in real life as well. And so whenever I see interviews of them breaking that ice, being a little bit more funny, a little bit more carefree, I'm like, oh my God, like they're so cool. Like I wanna go watch this movie even more. It makes me wanna put my money towards it. It makes me wanna put my money towards it. And Dune also works works so well because of the start and the spark of it, which is Denis Villeneuve. Villeneuve. Hi, my name is Denis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. My name is Denis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. My name is Denis Villeneuve. Is the spark, he's the start, he's the like center of this movie and he is the reason why it works so well. In his interview on Fresh Air, I, you've probably seen it because it's been clipped a lot, is that he says if he could make a movie with no dialogue, he would, because you should be able to watch a movie without any dialogue and be able to tell what's going on. And when I watch Do Now, I really do try to think about like, if they weren't saying anything, like would I be able to like get the essence of the story? And I think I would be. I think a lot of his storytelling is so visually impactful. I think that's what differentiates Dune from a lot of other franchises is the lack of exposition. Dune is the the like opposite. It's like the opposite force to exposition. It really doesn't want to explain anything. And I really love that. I think that in Dune part two, there's a little bit more because you're having Timothy enter a new space, which is the Fremen people. Whereas in Dune part one, you don't really have him introduced to anything um, in the main parts of the movie. I know at the end he, he gets you know introduced to the Fremen. I love having questions after the movie. And so the fact that Dune really lays off of this whole exposition route is very interesting. And Denny said it was a very fine line that he had to draw between exposition versus 
versus just showing what is going on. And I think he does that incredibly. And I think that differentiates Dune from other movies in a massive way because I feel like time and time again, I'm left watching things of new worlds and new um, ideas and, and you know, there's creatures and there's, and there's, you know, hierarchy set in place and it's a monarchy and then there's powers and now there's all this stuff going on. And I feel like I'm just being fed the information constantly through a straw being like, this is everything. Like, don't forget it. Like it's ending explain before ending explain even has a chance to explain it. Like you're gonna run ending explains channel to the ground if you keep filling every single movie with so much exposition. You need to let him have his job. And Dune does that. Dune lets you do the work on your own as you should, as movies should be, as art should be. Like I am filled with joy to be seen to be seeing something that is not mindless viewing or something you do have to do a little bit more work to enjoy it. I think that's fun. And this is coming from someone who you're probably like, Trin, we've seen you be stupid on camera so many times. What the fuck are you acting like you know how to like figure out a movie on your own? I agree, I agree. But like, I you know, I never said I was perfect. I never said that I knew how to like walk through a movie on my own without my hand being held. Like, you know, like every everybody makes mistakes and sometimes they're recorded online and like, I've solidified my stance online with a lot of misinterpretations of movies, a lot of the times. And some of those were movies made for children, so there's no real excuse. I think that Dune's success comes from the perfect formula. Not only is it in the movie sense of like, it's a good movie. I think, you know, talking more of like marketing standpoints, like it is the perfect formula. It's the casting, it's the tone, and it's the unwillingness to sacrifice your vision for a dime. And I think that having someone like a visionary like Denny is very important to this to make sure you're not only securing a dime now you're securing you know a timeless film within uh film history and i know that sounds very dramatic that sounds like i'm i'm literally like a film bro right now but i think it's very important i think that you're not only looking at the immediate success of it you're also looking at the success of dune the name dune down the line 10 years from now and what people will think about when they think of dune are they going to be thinking about another failed franchise that had a bunch of actors in it that regret being associated with it or are you going to be having some that really changed the face of cinema and how we look at action sci-fi films to this day and the one thing that i'm not going to do is leave the success of Dune just to the familiar faces that we know and can recognize. It's not just because of Timothy Chalamet's face and like, you know, his talent or Denis Villeneuve's- My name is Denis Villeneuve. Filmography and what we trust in his work or, you know, even like Christopher Walken, like thousands of people that worked on this movie different teams and units for every single part of it. There was a sandworm unit to make something that Timothy Chalamet could stand on so we could ride the worm. There's literally a dedicated person on the Dune set that is just, he is just there to make sure that the cast and crew knows the lore of Dune. So if they have any questions about Dune, the book, he is going to be able to answer them. He's a Dune expert. I watched a TikTok on it and he is, is there like, it's all of these people that make Dune so successful. It's that attention to detail that is so important when making a franchise and making a franchise that has longevity. It's not just about the immediate success of this film and how much money they can rack in with just Dune part two. It's about the future that you see for it and what could come out of this universe. It's very exciting and it's very wonderful to see, but there are thousands of people that work on every movie. Like Dune is no exception to that. Like Dune is no exception to that. I don't know why, but I definitely do sound like I was a part of that team. I was not a part of the Dune team. I did not make, I was not a part of the making of Dune, even though I like wish I was like, and I'm jealous that I will never be a part of a Dune team. But like, I think it is so amazing and like, I was very passionate in why I believe that Dune succeeded in, in, in comparison to other franchises that worked. And I think that like seeing this pattern, I think we're gonna be seeing a lot of other franchises and films follow in Dune's footsteps, or at least I hope so, because I think that it has a very big 
uh, I think has a very perfect formula right now. And it's they're very calculated and smart in their execution of their work. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of films similarly like uh, following soon. Let me know what you guys thought of Dune. And if you agree with anything that I said today, I love talking about not only the movies with you guys, but the reason you guys think it succeeds. What makes you think that Dune succeeds? Is it just the cast? Is it just the storyline? Is it the source material? Is it the direction of the film? It is, it is, is it the costumes that just make a distinct difference? Like, let me know all your thoughts. I would love to know everything that you guys think of Dune. I think it's very interesting to see as an audience, what we all think makes something successful because we're the very people that like, the films are trying to get to come back to the movie theaters and get to really be invested in their stories. And I love to hear that from like an audience perspective because you know, I have my opinions, but I would love to know yours. So leave down your Dune comments down below or let me know what you thought about the movie. I would love to know what you guys thought about Dune part two because I loved it. I thought it was so fun. I was literally like clenching my butt. I was literally on my on the edge of my seat, like squeezing my hands like I was, so invested in this movie and I was so in awe of everything on screen. I think it was visually like a masterpiece. And I think that like story-wise it, it, it tricked me. It tricked me just like it had hoped to. Like it got me excited at times and then I, and I was very disappointed at the end. Anyways, thanks guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye. You know, I thought this was gonna end up looking a lot better than the the result of it all. Ooh, ooh, I don't wanna look like this anymore. Austin, how did you do this? You still look fucking crazy. Uh, oh my God, I look like the unknown. It's the unknown!